So I just prioritise the first ones that fall out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Rachel Joy, Raul Cruz, Cynthia Fatos, Ruth Patel, and Wendy Bell. Cool. I send them all to print.
I'm going to just do this so I don't flap my notes. Hello, good morning. Um, welcome to Thoas, to a place that's very familiar to some of us. Um, um, there are more than me who have in this room who've been associated with Thoas for more than 40 years. I've often sat on this platform. I've often sat in really terrible meetings in this room, um, usually to be told off for our poor financial performance, which um, wasn't what we thought we were going to do when we came here. And it's wonderful, though. You know, we always grumble about SOAS, but it is so nice to be back here. It's a wonderful institution. It's like nowhere else on earth. I know today we're not going to get so much of a flavour of that, perhaps, as we would like, because it's, it's a summer term. But really, thanks to SOAS very much for hosting this event today. Um, and I've lost track of how many events, how many of these Kushwant Singlet Fests we've had in London now. The fifth. The fifth. Yes, in, is that including the online one last year? Yeah. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a great event. It's obviously, as you will know from the name, it's to promote the legacy of Kushwant Singh, who is author, scholar, journalist and iconoclast. And many of you may not know that he studied in London, and London was an important part of his life and his concerns. And here, one of the, fe one of the festival's aims here is to make these connections, connections between London and India and Pakistan, um, that is... That is that was so much important to him. And along with another aspect of his life, which you may not know so much about, which was his love of ecology. And one of the things this festival does is to promote ecology. And each, in the name of each speaker, there will be a tree planted in the Sundarbans, I believe, um, to celebrate his legacy. Most of you will know Rahul Singh, Kushwant's son, who I know is going to say a few words. He's, he's sort of trying not to say too many words, but Rahul, may I please invite you to say a few words to inaugurate the festival. Thank you, Rachel. Actually, uh, we are here at SOAS I think partly because of you. Uh, and uh, uh, earlier on, we were at King's College, but SOAS, I would like to also thank SOAS for, you know, having, hosting us here. And the SOAS library. <laughs> the SOAS library, okay. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming here. Um, I'll let Rachel do most of the talking, but I thought I would just say one, talk about one aspect uh, of my father, Kushwan Singh. And I think it is something which is, was very much a part of his, and that was his uh, sense of humor. Um, you know, um, uh, till quite recently, the biggest selling books in the uh, stations all over India were Kushwan Singh's joke books. Uh, and you could find them all. Now they, there are no books being sold at the railway stations. I, I noticed when I went last traveling by train, there are now no books. But at one time, a lot of books used to be sold in at stations for people to you know, read during the journey. Now, of course, everybody's got their smartphones and cell phones and all that. So there's not. But humor was something which was absolutely integral to my dad and his personality. And uh, not only that, but I think humor is something which is integral to a democratic country, a dem democratic nation. It's only the authoritarian countries which somehow uh, there is not much humor. And I'd just like to mention two jokes, true, li true story anecdotes about my father. Uh, one was that uh, he never took himself too seriously, and he felt that one of the big failings of important Indians was they took themselves too seriously. So he uh, he used to be quite outrageous. Also, he used to you know upset a lot of people because he liked to say things as he felt they were. Um, and um, he once uh, 
he must have outraged somebody living, I think, in America at that time, uh, because that person sent him uh, a very uh, angry letter. And on the uh, envelope of that letter, it was just simply addressed to Kushwan Singh Bastard India. <laughs> And he loved to show everybody, all the guests who came there, look, it got to me. Uh, the, the, the post office in India knew exactly where, where, he, where he stayed, so it got to him. So he used to love to show this to everybody. So that's one joke, uh, and true story, actually. And then um, the other one was in the columns that he used to write, uh, uh, you know, he wrote a column nonstop for over 50 years. At the end of that column, there was always a joke. Um, and a lot of those jokes were about Sikhs, Sardarjis, as uh, they're called, you know, in India. And um, there, was, uh, there were two Sardarjis who were, you know, known as Santa and Banta. And there were these, no, they became known as Santa Banta jokes. And it was all about, you know, uh, Sikhs, um, uh, you know, Sikhs have always been the butt of humor in India for a long, long time. And a lot of the jokes are actually made up by Sikhs themselves. So he used to have these jokes, Santa Banta jokes at the end of his column. And then he got a letter, very official letter, from what is known as the SGPC, which is the Sriomani Gurdwara Prabandak Committee, which is the highest authority of the Sikhs, you know. Um, they lay down the law and everything, and they can uh, sort of also excommunicate you if they feel that you're going against, if a Sikh is going against the Sikh tenets. So they, he got this letter from them uh, saying, please stop your Sadaji Santa Banta jokes. So he thought about it for a little. I was there actually in the house, thought about it for a little while, and then he sent them a postcard and he used to send postcards to a lot of his, his uh, people who wrote to him. He used to send them a postcard. I've even been in a village down south where when the, I, my, the car I was in had to be repaired and all. So I was whiling away my time. And then somebody at that car mechanics place uh, heard that I was Kushwan Singh's son. And he went running inside his uh, small village hut and he came out with a postcard that my father had sent him. I was so touched by that. He was a former army man, and he had treasured this postcard that my father had sent him because he had written something to my father. Anyway, Dad communicated with a lot of people in India through postcards. He used to have a stack of postcards at his desk, and every day people used to write to him, used to reply to them in postcards. And there are so many people in India who treasure those postcards that he wrote to them. Anyway, he got one of those postcards, addressed it to the SGPC, Shirmani Gurdwara Padur, and he just put three words there, go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> and he never heard from them again. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's my little bit of introduction to my father. Humor was so important. He got very upset during that period of when there was a lot of terrorism and, you know, uh, Sikhs were looked upon with great suspicions, See, with great suspicion. Um, the Sikh jokes dried up. Nobody dared say a Sikh joke because they felt, you know, the Sikhs were, you know, um, uh, being questioned whether they had links with terrorists and all that. And he got very upset that there were no Sikh jokes. And then when the Sikh jokes come, came back again, he said, now the Sikhs are back in the mainstream. So he was very happy that the joke, and of course now the jokes are all there, Sikh jokes. So I'll end on that and let Rachel, I'm sorry I'm taking up so much time just to make a small point. Come, Rachel. I, th I think your father got away with uh, many things. I mean, he even teased me once and lived, so um, 
I think I think we can say that. Right, my real job today is to keep everybody on time. I think that's very important. And we've got two sessions this morning that we're looking forward to. Um, the first one is something I'm really excited about because I've got two people, as I count among my friends, uh, Imtiaz Tarka and Ruth Padel, um, reading poetry. So that's a wonderful way to start a Saturday morning. And two people who are um, very important to the aims of the festival and indeed to SOAS, because Imtiaz holds an honorary doctorate from SOAS and her uh, former father-in-law did his PhD here in the 1930s, I believe. So a long, a long connection. Imtiaz, of course, as we always say, needs no introduction as a poet, artist, and video filmmaker. And I'll just mention two of her major distinctions because there are so many. She holds the Queen's Gold Medal for Poetry and she's Chancellor of Newcastle University. Um, Ruth Padel, of course, is also similarly distinguished as an award-winning poet, author, and novelist, and has many links to India. And Ruth also is, a wild, is interested in wildlife conservation, among her many um, other passions. Um, music, you're probably also familiar with her knowledge of music. And um, she's Professor of Poetry Emerita at King's College London, and very exciting for me, she's writing a non-fiction book on elephants called The Elephant Under the Rainbow. Um, the two of them are also um, selling and signing copies of their books afterwards. They're not here at the bookshop, so I do hope um, you'll take advantage of that. Imtiaz and Ruth, I'd like to invite you on stage and remind you that we have 45 minutes. Um, looking forward very much to hearing you both reading. I am not going to construct this. You've planned it. Thank you. Welcome Thank you. both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for that lovely introduction. And Rahul for that reminder of how wonderful Khushwant was. Uh, Khushwant was the first person who ever published my poetry when I was completely unknown. I'd never published anything. He just took a chance on this uh, unknown person. He just liked the poems, and he gave me a page in the Illustrated Weekly when uh, I was no one. So I'll never forget that. He was also the kind of person who cut across borderlines and all kinds of bullshit, if you'll forgive my language. Uh, my father, who came from Sialkot and then lived in Scotland, was a lifelong admirer of his. And what he really loved was his irreverence and his humor, which crossed borders in all kinds of ways. And my father didn't approve of most of what I did with my life, but every time I mentioned Khushwan Singh, I could get through to him and his eyes lit up. So I'll start with a poem I wrote about Khushwan, which some of you may have heard before, but uh, it's my way of saying thank you to him and to the festival. Not a nice man to know. Acid-tongued mischief maker, spotlight stealer, story stalker, salt in the wound piss taker, punchline grabbing headline hogger, not nice, not a nice man to know. Spit in the eye straight talker, shaker upper, elbow in the ribs ego breaker, Body shameless gossip monger, whiskey guzzling guzzle lover, not nice. Of all the Sikhs he was sicker, pricker of pride, poker and pecker away of the accepted order. Sparing neither man nor God, not nice at all, not a nice man to know. Half his heart in Lahore, half in Amritsar, one foot in Delhi, one in the gutter. Son of a gun and Sir Soba Singh, malice towards one and all. If you're not expected, don't ring the bell. If you expect to be respected, go to hell. Not a nice man to know, I know. But I wish that I had known him longer. And I wish there were more like him in the world. 
Not nice to know, but they don't grow on trees, people like him. So it's worth remembering Hushwan Singh. Not nice, but he took us all under his wing. The young, the outspoken, the runaways, the rebels and poets, the broken things. And this is why we gather to sing of him. While he is laughing up there, in the place he didn't believe in, drinking a peg or three with the boss, who's still not the boss of him. So here's to the man who we know is not nice to know, but we want to know and go on knowing, and knowing that the way we know him is always growing. Hushvant, Hushvant, Hushvant Singh. Thank you. Um, as I said, my father was a great admirer. Uh, and I grew up in Glasgow. And in Glasgow, my father was always very proud of, uh, of fitting in with local habits and customs, but especially of speaking the language like a local. Chaudhary Sher Mubarak looks at the loch. Light shakes out the dish rag sky and scatters the water with sequins. Look, hen, says my father, Loch Lomond, as if it were all his doing, as if he owned it, laird of Lomond, laird of the language. He's proud to say hen, and even more loch, with an och, not an och, to speak proper Glaswegian like a true-born Scot, and he makes the right sound at the back of the throat because he can say hush and khwab and khamosh because the sounds for happy and dream are the words that swim in the water for him. So he says it again. Hen, look, the loch. I... Uh, I read this poem called Hirayath, Old Bombay. And Hirayath is one of those almost untranslatable Welsh words that means something in the region of a longing to return to something that's no longer there. And Bombay, as we know, is a city whose name has been changed. I would have taken you to the Nas Cafe if it had not shut down. I would have taken you to the Nas Cafe for the best view and the worst food in town. We would have drunk flat beer and cream soda and sweated on plastic chairs at the Nas Cafe. We would have looked down over the dusty trees at cars creeping along Marine Drive round the bay to Eros Cinema and the talk of the town. We would have held hands in the Nas Cafe over sticky rings on the tabletop knee locked on knee at the Nas Cafe, while we admired the distant stock exchange, Taj Mahal Hotel, Sasundok, Gateway. We would have nursed a drink at the Nas Cafe, and you would have stolen a kiss from me. We would have lingered in the Nas Cafe till the day slid off the map into the Arabian Sea. I would have taken you to Bombay if its name had not slid into the sea. I would have taken you to the place called Bombay if it were still there. And if you were still here, I would have taken you to the Nas Cafe. I read um, a love poem. Uh, in a way, it was, uh, I was trying very hard to write um, a dream that I had after my husband died. And um, I, the, the, it just didn't work at all. It, it didn't work in any poem that I was trying to write. But somehow when I started to write a sonnet, the dream found its way into the middle of the, of the sonnet and somehow it found a place there and it seemed to work. The trick. In a wasted time, it's only when I sleep that all my senses come awake. In the wake of you, let day not break. Let me keep the scent, the weight, the bright of you. Take the countless hours and count them all night through till that time comes when you come to the door of dreams, 
carrying oranges that cast a glow up into your face. Greedy for more than the gift of seeing you, I lean in to taste the colour, kiss it off your offered mouth. For this, for this I fall asleep in haste, willing to fall for the trick that tells the truth, that even your shade makes darkest absence bright, that shadows live wherever there is light. Um, a long time ago, I was forced, persuaded against every, every better instinct to go and see, see a shadow reader. This is someone who measures the shadow and tells you your future. In the year of my death, when I was 25, the shadow reader said I would live to a ripe old age. He wet his finger flipped a page and told me the year of my death. That year has arrived. <laughs> the Rose Garden. When you come back from the Rose Garden, your eyes have changed color and the scent of Uttar follows you home. You arrive in the city of pointing fingers to howling sirens and beeping phones, the clicking, the screens all on and you still have petals falling from your mouth. You cross from corner to corner like a fugitive in this time. Your eyes are watercolour. In them, the city and all its workings have been stamped with guilt. The script blazes over the walls of the meat market, but the streets are brambled, thorned, and on the illuminated borders, there are drops of blood. Story. In the manuscript, the verses are written out on pages washed with subtle colour, aquamarine, coral, peach. The artist has worked with a crafty hand and picked out this one word in blue, hikayat, story. On the gold fleck page, an insect has bitten through the edge of story. Silverfish. I hope you swallowed that sliver of guilt. But the roses are savages that will circle and eat you alive, given the chance. Uh, this poem is based on a drawing in Queen Victoria's sketchbook of Dulip Singh tying a turban on a young boy's head. Letter smuggled to a boy. There is a crowd standing behind you, but you are unaware, engrossed in the task of tying a turban for a child from another country, tucking in the curls to make it right, saying, this is what we wear, where I come from. This is who we are. Who we are. We stand outside the line of vision, millions of us laborers in paradise gardens who scurry underground so our shadows never cross the path of the king. If we have faces, they are not drawn here. There is no paper large enough to find or hold us. The pages of this sketchbook rustle like the forest they come from and speak another language, knowing the surge of sap and leaves breaking through to somewhere high and dangerous. At 16, you're kneeling beside a, a royal child being painted by a queen with a silver and sable brush. Cobalt washes over seas and continents, rinses a country away behind your back, separating you from who you are and what you could have been. Face to face. Who is telling this story? The one who gives the gift or the one who takes? Can the writer be forgiven by the one who is written? Does the warp look back at the one who is weaving and say, this is not how I remember it, not how it happened at all. Who belongs in this thing you are making? 
The rose garden abandons its symmetry and lifts off the page with a mind of its own. The wind spreads rumours, new languages blowing, written in a script that looks like your heart beating. Windows tilt to catch sunlight at a different angle. The moon tips over to fit in another palm, in another hemisphere. Let your hands slide off parchment to touch human skin. Open the other face. Look in. Saying no. Even at 25, I could do without astrologers telling me what I should not do. But that was before I learned the art of saying no. No one knew how much I didn't want to go. So here I am, stuck with the shadow reader's long-term head fuck. Excuse the language, it's, uh, but in, quite in keeping with Kushvant's uh, life as well. Um, I was in the bar of the Station Hotel in Hull and imagine seeing Philip Larkin there sitting alone. Now, Philip Larkin didn't like foreigners or foreign things very much. And he, I imagined him sitting at a table drinking beer. Would I go up and speak to him if he were there? Never. Would he even see me? No, of course not. I'd be nothing more than a kind of unwelcome blot on the edge of his vision. But playing with that thought, I moved on to resurrect him as a young man and began to construct his imaginary profile on a dating app. If he were ever to be on such an app, what would he give away in real life? So this poem is called Swiping Left on Larkin. Here, he's younger, his shoulders thinner. She flicks a finger, swipes left. He is dismissed without a flicker. If they pass on the street, she sees a boy trudge by with a book and satchel under the arm on the way to a lifetime of drudge, easy to overlook. In the edge of his eye, she's a blur between staying or dying, a whiff of abroad, the chaos of prams and infants teething. At the end of every birth is grieving. He takes the dark for a walk his light on a leash through the sputtering streets of a town caught in the act of drowning. From a window a curtain is waving, but his back is turned. Shops shut up and shutters come down on the chatter of living, the guttering years. All roads lead to a leaving. He goes into the bar of the station hotel, sits for a while. When he leaves, he leaves a pale ring on the table. Gold spills out of basements over his feet. He walks down a street and out of his name. Beyond rumour and fame, a flurry of letters blown into gutters, the glitter of language on cobbles, his words remain, bright as believing or half-believing. At the end of the world, there is always the sea and its breathing, swiping right, swiping right, across a blue screen to something beginning. So how does this work, I ask? This is clearly a stupid question. The shadow reader tuts. His mouth is a purse pulled tight. To understand the shadow, you have to see the light. At some point with all this happening this year, I was writing my will and was told I could also be bequeath my digital writing, um, my digital history as well. And I thought that was a horrifying idea. Imagine all the junk of emails kept forever for someone to inherit. But these were some of the things I looked at, some of the kind of junk I was looking at, not necessarily all mine. She is trying on the pre-loved shoes. Parcels are pouring in from eBay and from Amazon. I've taught the dog to sign for them and take them in. Sometimes he buries them in the back and that's a relief because the bins are overflowing and the throwaway things are snarling at me with eyes bulging out of the corners of every room. She has an off day. Sod off if you've sold the book 
or bagged the prize or launched a career or lost a stone in lockdown and dropped to dress size. Sawed off if you managed the holiday in Sharm el Sheikh and posted a picture of the swimming pool and the strawberry mojito you're sipping this minute with a pink umbrella and ice. When I'm not like this, I'm nice, really. Smiley face. Bubbles experiences a moment of dread. Supposing it comes back into fashion to bury the dead with all they possess. The laptops, phones, chargers, computers, flat screens, consoles, cupboards, sofas. The shame of it. The scale of the tomb to be sunk underground for the cars and hair dryers, the unworn unworn dresses, too tight to wear, too dear to lose. Think of the tons of soil to be shoveled out of the earth for the shoes. My God, the shoes. Your session has been terminated. He took my shadow like a, an unstitched length of cloth, washed the stories out and hung the rest to dry. What's left when the mess is rinsed away. Messages left everywhere. Parts of speech the passerby can only faintly hear. The best and least of what there is to say before the whole world shudders to a stop and the frozen frame becomes a shrine to what we were. Touched by God, profane. We've lost you, you're breaking up. We'll come back to you when we have a better line. Try switching off and switching on again. It works sometimes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and the wonderful, wonderful Ruth Padell. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a delight and privilege to read with Imtiaz and to hear those poems. Thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me to the festival. I feel as if, as if I walked into a bit of India. But I'm very distressed to hear there are no more, more bookshops in, on the stations. Um, I love those bookshops. You met so many wonderful things in them. Readers, they were called readers. Yeah. Mm. Well, I'm going to start with, um, with a poem whose first line was given to me by a wonderful actress who is no more with us, who died um, during COVID, and um, I read at her funeral. And this is, and some of you may have known her, Alaknanda Samart. Um, she was a dear friend, and she was the one who introduced me to first of the Nehru Centre when Girish Karnad was there, and he introduced me when I was writing my book about tigers to all sorts of things. So, and Alec said, well, you're writing about tigers. The thing is, Ruth, every Indian, whether they've ever been outside a, a city or not, they have a very clear idea of what the tiger is. It is water, moonlight, <coughs> danger, and dream. And I thought, wow, okay, that's, that's it. So this is, <coughs> this is it, tiger drinking at forest pool. Water, moonlight, danger, dream. Bronze urn angled on a tree root. One slash of light, then gone. A red moon seen through clouds, or almost seen. Treasure found but lost, flirting between the worlds of lost and found. An unjust law repealed, a wish come true, a lifelong sadness healed. Haven in the mind for anyone hurt by littleness. A prayer for the moment saved. Treachery forgiven. Flame of the crackle glaze tangle. Amber reflected in grey milk jade. An old song remembered. Long debt paid. A painting on silk which may fade. 
So I'm very excited to have a tree planted in my name in the Sundarbans. The Sundarbans, both in India and in Bangladesh, are in this book, and some of the tigers in them. But I want to go on now to the title, We Are All From Somewhere Else. And this book, um, which is on migration, migration of cells, animals, people, souls, couldn't, the, the, the photograph on it is now the photograph of what our current Home Secretary wants to disparage. Small boats, people trying to make their homes, <coughs> having had to leave their home. But I'm going to start with um, migration of cells. It's an extraordinary thing that cells migrate in our bodies. Cells migrate for two main reasons. When a woman is, when a woman is, is pregnant, to, to cells migrate to, to make the fetus. And when we are ill or when we are um, infected with something, cells rush there to try and, and keep keep our body healthy, to, to, make, to repair the damage. So also in the body, of the, the body politic of society, um, migration helps us to make and renew the organism and to keep infection out. But this is, I'm here thinking of the very first cell where we all come from, which the nearest thing to it in our society is blue-green algae. Um, first cell. Oh, yeah, there's lots of arguments about how the first living cell, the beginning of life, got to the world. First cell, born in a deep sea vent, synthesized by lightning in a reducing atmosphere, or carried here by meteorite. We are all from somewhere else. Algae. First self-replicating molecule on Earth pulls carbon from organic substrate, performs the world's first magic, photosynthesis of oxygen, and creates copies of herself, uncountable as starlings flocking, or the pure gold bricks Sheba sent to Solomon by mule. Cell in the air, on the rocks, song hoping to be heard in a heart cut open, little blue-green dreaming of pattern and form, tiny horsemen of apocalypse. So this is... Um, this poem is set in Mumbai or, or Bombay or, or maybe both. Um, and it's really, it's for Guy Patel, a friend of mine who's a painter and who for a long, long uh, lifetime was a doctor as well. And um, he painted this painting called The Letter Home. I think you'll hear about it. But it's, it's all about migration. It's about the migrant workers who come to big cities, Bangalore, Bombay, to... Um, <clears throat> for work and what they leave behind. The letter home. You painted the Saturday queue for the letter writer in shadow of the unfinished flyover. I have health again and again. I am sending the money home. But what is home? Where you began, where a sister with a husband whose salary is regular, but he resents you anyway, this indigent who sees more of the world than he, has turned your family against you while you are gone. Or where the journeys take you, where the work is, when you sleep behind plastic tacked to Uranus breeze block and cook at the edge of a five lane you are helping to build, washed watched by ashy-necked crows who make their nests out of sanitary towels from mounds of trash to the east. We are breaking stone for the motorway. I will come home when work is done. Under the luminous fuzz that does for stars in this city, you look into the well 
wondering where it went wrong, what you could have done better. Look up. The hurt sky is bandaged in cloud. Earth has reversed its magnetic field, and the Mumbai monsoon, blown sideways like glycerine skirts, has calmed the grit that gets everywhere into wet silk paintable gleams, reminding us where it has come from, this element we all desire and have to struggle with. Home, the round white pebble with a blue cut heart. Whole geological dowries of copper, hooded turquoise, amethyst. When I was working on migration, and this book has little essays about migration of different forms through, through time, um, I realised that home and migration are actually two sides of the same crystal. Um, you know, people migrate because they're leaving a home, because they can't live in a home, and they're looking to find a new home. It's part of the same coin. Um, this, this is not set in India, this is set in Greece, where I've lived a lot. And um, after the Syrian uprising started, I went to Lesbos. I'd been there once before, but not for a long time. And um, I talked to Les Lesbos Islanders there. And one thing, they were very, very, you know, they nearly got to the Nobel Peace Prize, the Lesbos Islanders, for how they helped the Syrian refugees in 2016, 2015. Um, one, one thing about Lesbos is that it's very near Turkey and very near what's now Izmir, but was then Smyrna in 1922 when there were huge massacres there. And a lot of the Greeks who were in Smyrna left and where they came to was Lesbos. And so I talked to a wonderful woman, a, 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 mag, a newspaper editor, whose grandmother told her the same sorts of stories that the Syrian refugees were telling now. So this, this poem has got different voices in it. It's got the voices of uh, the Syrians. I, I've worked with a Syrian artist on, on this for a long time, and it's his title, um, but also of the Lesbos Islanders. Dark water, burning world. <clears throat> the waves talk to their gods. The waves have their prey. The dead bump sideways in gullies gouged from grey fire. An arm, a trailing bloom, sodden in the surf. Where does the wave end and water around it begin? How do you separate self from the other, edge from the flesh? Shadows of ourselves, no more than a shiver on water, then another life and another like the waves and the dead face down, slamming the shore. Last night, we waited again, listened to the dark by bales of silver survival blankets donated by foreign charities, listened to night wind, the sighing of pine tree and tamarisk, slap, slap of water on rock, slap, slap of our hearts. This is where they come, and their stories are stories. My grandmother Small girl escaping the furnace of Smyrna. This is how it begins, claiming a new place on earth. Through waves like rings of a tree, rings of the centuries, blown furrows over the sea that has known so many battles, so many deaths, to the foam and stone of our island's edge. And the families broken. The boy who went ahead to Europe, lost. The father, a forgotten hand whose fingers feel for the dark. Find the lowest star on the horizon, she said to her firstborn, 15 last year. Fix your eyes on all that, all night on that, and you'll be safe. Her bird soul batters its way to Germany. Impossible to penetrate as the emeralds of paradise. 
Moon after moon has gone by, waiting, forking out more and more money for smugglers, for their excuses. The right time, the right wind, surveillance, no moon, wait a while longer. All for this terror, rocking and spilling on the water alone. Those facing backwards see smudges of rose like fire on the black lace sky. That was our home. Not in our time, Lord. Yes, in our time. And the heart tap-tapping its prison of bone. The wave rolls over. We feel it thrash through the thin rubber skin of the dinghy. How it hates us and our life jackets bought at blood price. Will this be the wave, this mirror maze of lidded muscle fluted like the moon, a roaring of smithereen silver, slate-finned like a shark, hour by hour denser and colder, sliding away to the spire and spine of a breaker to fling us up, spill us down in full view of a long-gazed-at shore where there was nothing all night where there was nothing, just grey mist. Here is a shape abandoned by Charon, steering through the small starlight of cell phones, bursting on rocks, grit chipping, lancing the skin, pull them out of the sticks, find the rhythm. Wet to the bone, they hug one another and shiver and they cry. Sharp pebbles, whispering trees, our language strange, no doubt, and our hands rough, slippery, pulling them out from the last tug of waves to a sleepy burble of doves. Wet faces in dawn's crumpled blaze, lit for each other, as if water kept its shape after the jug has broken one shining, petrified moment before the shattered pieces fall away. Well, I'm going to go to um, Jaipur now, and um, I went. I was invited to go to Jaipur, just as my mother had, was dying. She was 97, and she got an aneurysm. And of course, I said, I'm, "You know, I'm not going." But she was a, a toughie, and for some reason, we didn't know it at the time. It sort of stabilized, and it lodged in her back somewhere. This thing. And um, so she was in the hospital. I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm cancelling Jaipur. Of course I am. She said, no, 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 you've got to go. And um, you, didn't dis you didn't disobey her lightly. Um, and also I was writing this book called Emerald. And I was, I'd been researching emeralds for years. And Jaipur is the emerald city. And I was due to go and see some emerald cutters and all sorts of things. Um, but, and she said, you don't get yourself out there. Um, so I went. Um, and this is this is called, this poem is just called Jaipur. I can't go to India, I said, with you in this state. Don't be silly. How can I go to Rajasthan through fog-bound Delhi, a six-hour change of plane, with an exploding aneurysm hanging like the sword of Damocles in your back? She argued, insisted she would be okay, and sent me off. But how did I know I'd see her again in the chaotic traffic of Jaipur? Taxis on strike, taking an outer rickshaw to the old bazaar. Pink walled alleys, colour of embers in a fading sky, filling up with motorbikes, electric tables, open drawers of second-hand CDs, a hanging alphabet of export surplus shirts and rhesus macaques running over red tile roofs in rubber masks. By the postern to the emerald dealer's yard, a baby monkey slid down a lamppost like a fireman, dashed across the street. She'd have cheered him on. The cutter in his tucked away white desk with a fluoride swing light. Emeralds, he said, all about light. Had a milky eye like a moonstone, something wrong since birth. He took linen pouches of raw gems out of hidden panels in the wall and poured them in my hand, while the dealer 
told the dual story of his town. Owners, brokers, the old Jane grading casts and emerald cutters, most of them Muslim, for hope can be found the other side of pain. Green is the colour of paradise. And for 500 years, the Mughal emperors ordered enormous crystals up from obscure shafts beneath the carbon heart of the Andes. Pink City became Emerald City, adept in the unique cutting properties of emerald, the only stone in which the flaws are prized. She was right, of course, still here when I got back to northern winter, early snowdrops, steel wool skies, the sun invisible burning somewhere else, Jaipur, and everyone anxious, shaky as a bubble in a carpenter's level. Signs taken for wonders, one hand up on the door. So she died very peacefully, but this is one way I'd like to remember. She was not a poet, she was um, a botanist, and um, she um, was a puncturer of people's ideas and myths and floweriness's. And um, the voice you hear at the, at the end was a voice which my friends have often heard all through my life. She liked a laugh. She hated pink, hydrangeas, marzipan, woolly thinking and pretense. She stuck to plain tap water, wouldn't have any truck with Perrier, superstition, bling. She believed in hard fact, how and why, the daily crossword, jokes, Latin names of plants, comedy on TV, and going on when eyes and ears and muscles failed, setting her alarm for 8am, even when the last nerve ends on her fingers withered, so she took an hour alone, refusing help to do up zips and buttons. What if I'd said one evening, lighting the lamp, cooking dinner while she took in the weather forecast? I believe that emeralds come from planet Venus, are found in the nests of griffins, emit the energy of Saturn, reveal the truth when placed under the tongue, and their powers a spiritual balance, wisdom, love, the reawakening of spring. I can just see the grin. Oh, Ruth. <laughs> well, for a long time, um, I was working on a book about Beethoven. I'll just do, read them five, ten minutes more. Um, and Beethoven became, for me, the great artist of lockdown. He was a... He was a a great creative artist of, of um, defying pain. So here's one about his, his, poet, his sonata, Moonlight Sonata, which was written just at a time when he was realising that he was going deaf. He was a young man of 30. He had the whole world in front of him. He knew he was a genius and something was wrong. And you can hear it in some of the Moonlight Sonata. Moonlight Sonata... We make the life we need. The city's bells are muffled. The sky is frozen copper. You still can hear sometimes, still win the improvising contests. A sonata in C-sharp minor, quasi-fantasia, like a blind girl lit by moonlight she cannot see. New melodies unfold from tiny seeds, euphoria, then presto aditato, manic rage. The music of loss, of losing. Bass clef, high treble only once and in despair. Then the new shocked calm of, is it true? Is this what it sounds like going? 
So I'll read the last poem. Um, he had a lot of tragedies in his life. He was always in love, often with very unsuitable, very rich and well-born girls whose parents whisked them away somewhere. Um, he did have one relationship, we don't know how long for, with somebody he called the Immortal Beloved, but that went. So this is right at the end. And one thing about him, which I think is, is um, relevant to your father, really. I mean, I think they would have got on. Um, there might have been a few sparks, um, but he, he loved to joke. Musica humana. And this is right at the end of his life. Um, he had his, I don't know, something, some huge dropsy or something which had to be lanced. And he's, but he was hoping to, he didn't realise it was the end. And there's a little, little letter that he wrote to a very old friend the, just in about three months before he died. I still hope to create a few great works and then, like an old child, finish my earthly course somewhere among kind people. The auditory canal, covered in glutinous scales, shining throughout the autopsy. The auditory arteries, thick and cartilaginous as if stretched over a raven's quill. And the auditory nerve <coughs> withered to a pure white strand. <coughs> but reading the last page in the book of his life on earth, how he joked to the doxa who lanced his belly, gallons of fluid gushing out across the floor. You remind me of Moses striking the rock with his staff. How he laughed when he could. How he read and reread with great joy, he said, a final gift, a 40 volume set of all the works of Handel. And how he died, lifting his fist as if it held a bird he would release into the storm pelting Vienna with snow, like the reckless feathers driving all our lives to seek the fullest experience of the air. I listen to Cello Sonata Op. 69 and hear the unquenchable spirit that powers every note he writes and lives on dancing, dancing in you, me, everyone. And on that note, the last poem, this is, um, this is a little pamphlet of poems I've written and brought out, just brought out now, about water and climate denial. And, um, you know, water is now on the front pages everywhere. But this is about a community in Colombia. When I was writing the emeralds, it was my son-in-law is Colombian. So on, on one hand, I was going to where the, the emeralds were dug up, and then I would go to Jaipur where they were cut. So it was sort of a strange um, tension. And this, I think, um, this is about hope, really. Um, if you're working anything on environment, I love the idea of all these trees being planted in the Sundarbans. Um, but you know, working on, you have to face things. It's no good not facing things. Um, and Seamus Heaney once said, hope is not optimism, which just, hopes, which just thinks that things will turn out for the better. Hope is saying that there is something worth hoping for. And this poem is in the, is in the shape of a lamp. Hope is a lamp made of water. Now you are leaving. Dip your hand in the sea. Scoop up the blue and green lozenges of all your past years. Electrolytes in a litre of salt water, gathered by the Waiyu indigenous community on the remote La Guajira Peninsula, a desert surrounded by ocean at the dangerous border between Colombia and Venezuela, who use salt water to light their night fishing. Electrical energy without needing to travel to find it. Power you don't have to buy from other people. A light source. New life running under this one. Pour everything in, hoping the magic will happen. Ionization will turn this raw mix into a thousand days of light. An invention that might save the world. Like your hand on my arm, skin on skin. One mind understanding another. Thank you. Sorry to have taken it. Thank you.
thank you to um, Ruth and Imtiaz for that wonderful opening and coming to a, a theme that I think we'll be returning